Okay, before we begin our example, I just want to go over one thing with you very quickly, just a recap of what we were talking about last time, so that you have a nice uh, short list of the properties for the various types of graphs. So the position time graph was the first graph that we looked at. And with the position time graph, we were able to say that the slope was equal to the velocity. We said that the area didn't equal anything, that it was not applicable on a position time graph. And we also said that the y-intercept is equal to the initial position of the object. Additionally, we can look at the shape of the graph, and if it's a horizontal line, then there's no motion. If it's a curved line, then there's an acceleration. Then we looked at a velocity time graph, and the features of the velocity time graph were this. The slope was equal to the acceleration. The area was equal to the displacement delta x, which we sometimes write as d. And remember that if the initial position is not given, then it's not possible to completely draw your position time graph. The y-intercept of the velocity time graph gives you the initial velocity. If the line is horizontal, then the velocity is constant. And if there is a slope, then we know that there's an acceleration and that we're never going to deal with it, but just in case you're not thrown off by it, if it's curved, then that means the acceleration is not equal to a constant. The acceleration is changing in time. Finally, we have the acceleration time graph. And the acceleration time graph, we generally don't have a slope just in case the slope is equal to the jerk. The area is equal to the change in velocity. So remember, in order to draw the velocity time graph, you have to know what V initial is. We didn't look at the y-intercept, and for almost all the cases that we're dealing with, or actually I should say all the cases that we're dealing with, with acceleration that it's going to be a horizontal line and the horizontal line means that it's a constant acceleration. Now when we look at the acceleration graph it's usually very straightforward and one thing I failed to mention last time is that if you have the acceleration change in the middle of the motion so for example um, you have two-part motion, you are accelerating from rest at a red light, and when you get up to your maximum speed, you move with a constant velocity. If you were to graph that with an acceleration graph, on an acceleration graph, you would see that you have an acceleration which is constant until you let up on the gas and you're moving with a constant velocity. Once you start moving with a constant velocity, then the acceleration is considered to immediately go to zero, and then the rest of the graph looks like this. Okay, so you could put a dotted line here, um, you know, where it immediately goes straight down. It could be a dotted line, it could be a solid line, it doesn't matter. We just have to indicate that it instantly goes to zero. Now, in real life, nothing instantly goes to zero or some other value but that's how we tend to do it on our graphs at this level because there's absolutely no point in trying to draw in that tiny little detail the one thing i want to discuss with you is how do i know that the y-intercept is meaningful and how do i know what it even means okay on the position time graph we say that the y-intercept is equal to x initial on the velocity time graph we say that the y-intercept is equal to v initial 
And maybe on some fundamental conceptual level, you could say, yeah, I can see that. That, that kind of makes sense. Well, where does that really come from? How do we know that for sure? You know, physics is really big on, you know, proving things. It just doesn't come from somewhere. We're going to do a lot of proofs this year. And, you know, the purpose of those proofs is to show that we're not making it up and it's not something mystical that you can't understand. So let's take a look at this. So the position time graph is basically giving us uh, displacement. And so I'm going to start by writing D is equal to VT. And this is um, the simplest case with a constant velocity. And D can be rewritten as delta x is equal to velocity times time, or x final minus x initial is equal to velocity times time. Or finally, we get x final is equal to vt uh, plus x initial. Now, this is huge, what I'm about to do here. It's called linearization, and it allows us to make some pretty amazing uh, interpretations of our graphs, or to be able to construct uh, graphs in such a way that we can really extract a lot of information that's not otherwise so obvious. And graphs are wonderful tools. I mean, they give you the ability to visualize your data, and interpretations and interpolations also become much easier as a result. Graphs let you know when you have outlying information. You know, you may look at your data and think, oh, no, that's that's not an outlier. And then you look at the graph and it's like, wow, that is really deviant from what everything else is that I have. Or maybe it's just the flip side of things. You're looking at your data table and you can see that you've got this one number that seems to be way out there in left field. Like it's just too big or too small by a lot. And when you plot it on a graph, it turns out to be just this, you know, little tiny jiggle in your information. It's no big deal. So linearization is really important. And uh, that's what I'm going to do now. Now, linearization is based on the equation of a straight line, right? So we have y equals mx plus b. That's the big thing with linearization. So for linearization, what we're going to do is this. We're going to say y is equal to mx plus b. And we know that y is the y-axis, x is the x-axis, b is the y-intercept, and the slope is equal to what to what comes in front of the x-axis. So in this case it's the velocity. Now we said that the slope of velocity or the slope of the position time graph was equal to the velocity. And linearization is one way of doing it. We also looked at it a little differently in the last video. So this is why I'm able to say that the y-intercept is equal to the initial position. For velocity, we're going to do it just a little bit differently. We're going to start with a is equal to delta v over t. And so if we rearrange that, we're going to get v final minus v initial is equal to a t. So v final is equal to a t plus v initial. So once again, we write y is equal to mx plus b. The y-axis is going to be velocity, the final velocity at various points in time. The x-axis is our time axis. The y-intercept is the initial velocity, and so the slope of the velocity time graph is equal to acceleration. So that's just to give you a taste and just a real quick overview of the things that we're going to be looking at in this example. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example now. And the most important thing when constructing these graphs like I've said before, is to set up three Cartesian coordinate systems. You want to have your position time graph, your velocity time graph, and your acceleration time graph all lined up on top of each other. Because what's going to happen is we're going to have iconic points in our graph. Things like where does it change direction? Because where it changes direction, you know that the um, 
velocity is going to go from positive to negative or negative to positive for example and so we want to be able to easily line up these parts of our graph the other thing that you want to do is to make sure that you highlight the important information of your graph for each one of your graphs and so we do that here um, by noting that the particle starts from rest so that's going to give us v initial is equal to zero we also know that we accelerate uniformly at three meters per second squared so the acceleration is equal to three meters per second squared and the time interval for this to occur is seven seconds all right and we also know that we start at a point which is 30 meters to the left of our origin so that means x initial is equal to a negative 30 meters okay so let's start by just putting down on our graphs the things that we know for certain right now and then we'll just start filling in the blanks based on the ideas the properties of the various types of graphs that we have all right so what do we have here um, we have the initial position is a negative 30 meters so we're going to go down on our graph to a negative 30 and if I say each line represents 10 meters per second or I'm sorry 10 meters then this is going to be minus 10 minus 20 minus 30 so at t equals 0 this is our initial position that's x naught now we don't know anything else about position at this point in time we just know that it's a negative 30 um, we also know that the initial velocity is 0 and so on our velocity time graph that's going to be right here and the acceleration is 3 meters per second squared and that's a positive value so we go to we'll make this one two three so right here we'll say that that's three meters per second squared all right now because this is constant acceleration that's not going to change for the entire interval and so we need to establish a um, scale for our x-axis and what we have are 14 lines all the way out here to the edge and so we'll say that each line is a half a second so that means our acceleration graph so out here is seven seconds and so our acceleration graph just looks like this should be a nice horizontal line I know that's anything but straight but uh, that should be a nice straight line okay so what else can we fill in now okay we got lots of work to do here so first things first we know that the velocity uh, starts at zero and in seven seconds it's gonna have to end up somewhere so how do we get v final well we know that v final is equal to v initial plus a t so the initial velocity was zero or v final is equal to 3 times 7 seconds which is 21 meters per second now uh, we've got uh, let's see here one two three four lines so we'll say that each one of these lines represents uh, 5 meters per second squared so this one would be 10 I know this is not quite all the way down where it should be but we'll go with it so we've got uh, 10 uh, 15 and 20 meters per second so all the way out here at 7 seconds we know that the velocity is 21 meters per second so V final is equal to 21 okay now because this is constant acceleration we know the shape of this line the shape of that line will be a straight line connecting those two points so it's going to look something like that all right so it looks like we're basically done with our velocity time graph we have filled in all the gaps there are or I should say maybe 
more appropriately, there are no gaps between the starting point at t equals 0 and the ending point at t equals 7. So this is our complete uh, graph for the velocity time graph. All right, but we still have to construct our position time graph. And to do that, we need to know where the object ends up. So where does the object end up? Well, we know that uh, d is equal to x final minus x initial, and we know what x initial is. So how do we get x final? Well, x final is going to be equal to d plus x initial. I'm just rearranging my equation here. So how do we get d? Well, d comes from the area of the velocity time graph. So how do we get the area here? Area is equal to 1 half times the base times the height, or area is equal to 1 half times the base was 7 seconds, and the height was 21 meters per second. So that's going to make the area equal to 73.5 meters, and that means the displacement is also 73.5 meters. And that's a positive value because this area under the curve is above the x-axis. So here the area is equal to 73.5 meters per second, I'm sorry, meters. Okay, so let's finish filling in our blanks for the position time graph so we can be done. D is equal to 73.5. Then we have x initial is equal to a negative 30. So that's plus a negative 30, which means our displacer, our um, final position, is equal to 73 minus 30 is going to be 43.5 meters. So if each line represents uh, 10 meters, we have 10, 20, 30, 40. So all the way out here at 7 seconds, we're going to be at um, 40, actually it's a little bit above there, right about there. That's going to be 43 and a half meters. So what does our graph look like? Well, remember one of our properties for a position time graph is that when it's constant acceleration, that we're going to have a um, sloped line, or I'm sorry, a curved line. So the curve, we've got two options. We can curve up like this, or we could curve like this. So what is it supposed to be? The clue to that is in the sign of the acceleration. The acceleration is positive. Okay, so the positive acceleration means that we have a parabola, because this is a parabolic line, should be in the shape of a parabola, and it's what we call concave up. So positive acceleration is a concave up line. Now, what does it mean to be concave up? That means that you form some part of a parabola which opens upwards. Doesn't matter which part, it could be just this little segment here, you know, from here to here. It could be a segment from here to here. It could be a segment from here to here or here to here. It doesn't matter. Any part of a parabola that has this shape is concave up. If the acceleration is negative, it's concave down. And concave down looks like that. And again, you pick, you know, it can be any of those points. So, uh, what we're looking at here is a positive acceleration that makes it concave up, and therefore we eliminate the concave down line. So this is the one that we get rid of.